Good morning, FCC. And uh, this is a special morning that uh, I get to share with you one of my favorite people in the entire world. Sitting to my left is Pastor Bernard Emerson. And if I told you everything that Bernard is involved in, I would take up all of his time for preaching this morning. He is uh, the senior pastor of Tapestry Church in Oakland. Tapestry is one of a kind. Uh, he and Kyle Brooks uh, together uh, spent about 18 months putting together your predominantly African-American church mm -hmm. with Kyle's predominantly white church and uh, merged Tapestry into one of a kind in Oakland that everybody, it seems like, when I talk to pastors that are looking at it as a new model mm. for doing church in Oakland. Wow. Um, and and uh, I, heard, uh, I heard one pastor say, we don't even recognize our church anymore, and that was pre-COVID-19 because everybody's moving out. And they, they say what, what um, Bernard and Kyle did in Oakland is kind of a precursor of what we need to be moving towards. Mm. So that's one thing he does. Second thing he does is he's also a denominational leader and he's a church planter, especially in terms of planting urban churches. Yes. And, uh, and some of the people that in terms of church planters, I'll tell you where he recruits them. He also teaches the Urban Ministry Institute at San Quentin. I did not mispronounce that. I didn't say Santa Barbara. I didn't say Santa Monica. I said San Quentin. He, he teaches 30 uh, church leaders. Did you know that San Quentin has a church of 400 people? Yeah. And these 30 leaders are part of your Tumi program. When they get released, then they go into a, a house that you do with tapestry with tapestry and world impact yep. that he's also the Bay Area leader of world impact and and uh, they go into a leadership home where they finish their to me which is the equivalent of a seminary degree and then they are ready to plant a church yeah. in the inner city in your spare time you and your wife Kim uh -huh. are foster parents yeah and um, and also you mentor at risk kids did I miss anything? No, you, you pretty much covered it all. <laughs> you know, it's like I try to keep up with them. Um, you know, nobody knows. If Bernard doesn't know you in the Bay Area, there's no reason to know you. Um, you know, I mean, in terms of your network is, is amazing, and I am proud to call you my friend. So am you know? I. I'm proud to call you friend, Roger. <laughs> you know, uh, so I've looked forward to this. I thought we we're going to be able to do it, you know, in front of a uh, live, full audience. But uh, this is as good as it gets now. But when we get, you know, post-COVID-19, mm -hmm. we're going to come together and we're going to do some special things together. So Bernard and I have been talking about what's happening in our society now, not just in America, uh, but around the world in terms of the George Floyd incident mm -hmm. in, uh, in Minnesota and the protest and the and the, uh, and the absolute breaking point that I think our society has come to. When we were talking before we mm -hmm. sat down here, you said there's something different yeah, it, this it, time. This, this just feels different. So, it, so it, tell us, you know, what, what, what it is. It, it, it feels different, um, uh, one, because people are protesting all around the world. And, and you mentioned it, uh, uh, protests have even hit Berlin. Now, this is pretty much the birthplace of white supremacy. Right. But, but people in Berlin are protesting. It tells me one thing. It tells me that um, people all over the world know how poorly black people are treated um, in America. So, so that's one way. It, it, this feels different. It, and it feels different uh, with the string of things that have been going on lately. Um, San Francisco um, just um, cut back the police, police budget. Um, NASCAR banned the Confederate flag. Um, in Virginia, they're tearing down Confederate statues. Um, um, 
uh, it, it just feels different. And Colin Kaepernick suddenly, yeah, he, yeah, people yeah. go, hey, maybe he was on to something. Yeah, and, 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 and thank God for it. I mean, some people say the, the NFL's apology is uh, too little, uh, too late. But, man, they did it, and, and they recognize it. So this just feels different. And it has me hopeful that real systemic change will take place in my lifetime. Uh, you know, we talked about it when, before we started recording that um, I've been in watching this since I was a freshman at UC Berkeley in 1968, right in the middle of the civil rights movement, right in the middle of, uh, you know, key assassinations of John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, you know, I thought that change, systemic change was happening then. And like we were talking about, it seems like every five to seven years, mm -hmm. something happens that reignites it, shows us that even though we've come quite a ways, we still have a long way to go. Um, I'm going to ask you a question mm -hmm. that I asked our good friend Ephraim Smith several years ago. We had just come back from a Transforming the Bay for Christ in, uh, event in Oakland, and uh, Ephraim had been interviewed um, um, not Michael McBride, Ben, ben McBride. McBride. I, had I spoke, remember that. Yeah, had spoken. So we're coming back, and Ephraim and I said, hey, let's have lunch uh, in Lafayette. So we stopped at Chow's Restaurant, and we're talking. And here's the question I ask him. I'm going to ask you. You know, we did not rehearse this. He does not know that this is coming. But I said, I said you know, um, Ephraim, I think I understand it. Uh, from a personal standpoint, I grew up in a multi-ethnic uh, community. I, I grew up in multi-ethnic schools. Um, then I went to UC Berkeley, very multi-ethnic. I've done my graduate work at, at Fuller. Um, so I said, Ephraim, I got one question for you. Mm -hmm. What don't I get? Mm. What, as a, what as a white guy who thinks he gets it? Mm -hmm. What is it that's impossible for me to really understand? Well, I, I would say you have to put yourself in proximity with uh, other people of color so that you can be close to the pain. Once you are close to the pain and you are uh, uh, you, 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 uh, in proximity with me and I share stories with you, that are uh, 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 painful and hurting to me, man, uh, uh, if you're human, you can't help but grieve with me. Right. And, and then you understand uh, 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 my plight and, and, and what I struggle with. And then um, um, you, you'll get it then. And, and uh, uh, that, my friend, um, will cause you to... Uh, uh, to want to show up with me, uh, uh, to want to speak up for me, uh, to want to uh, lock arms in solidarity with me. I, uh, we were talking about that one incident where there was an elderly African-American gentleman who was marching, and he said, I never thought in my lifetime, in my lifetime, mm -hmm. that I would see so many white people marching with me chanting Black Lives Matter. Yes. Now, you know, I hear oftentimes the church respond with that saying, no, all lives matter. Because <laughs> Jesus died for everybody. You know? right, right. We're not saying that other lives don't right. matter. We're not saying that blue lives don't matter. But what is it when, when how do you feel when people want to dismiss that and say, no, 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 not, not black lives, all ma lives matter. What? That's well, tone deaf. Well, well saying uh, all lives matter when I say black lives matter is the equivalent to me losing my grandmother and I'm grieving my grandmother and you say, you know, my grandmother died uh, a few years ago. And, 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 it, and, it, and it steals uh, uh, the moment from me grieving about my grandmother. And um, Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good. And, 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 and I think, you know, we're not saying, when we say black lives matter, we know all lives matter. It, it, it's just like uh, uh, breast cancer, breast cancer awareness month. Man, everybody uh, uh, wears 
a, a, a pink ribbon uh, for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And um, um, so it would be foolish for you to start talking about brain cancer during Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So we're not saying that uh, all lives don't matter. It's just saying uh, black lives need special attention right now. And you help us with this, and then we'll get to uh, everything else. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I heard somebody say recently, to be able to say in solidarity, mm -hmm. black lives matter, is the equivalent of washing feet. Mm. It's the equivalent of seeing somebody who's hurting and somebody who needs attention right now because they're grieving. Right. And, and it is entering into that pain, entering into that misunderstanding, entering into that oppression and, and giving, giving meaning, mm -hmm. you know, that, that it's, it's equivalent to say, I see you, you know, yes. and, and know you. You know, we know each other. Yes. You know, and, and we've been in the fight with each other on all kinds of different things. Um, whether it's, you know, the, the issue of trauma in the inner city, whether it's young people in the inner city or whatever, we've been in the fight together. So, um, so when, I look at, when I look at you, mm -hmm. you know, I, I remember the first time we met. You're sitting in a chair in a, in a meeting that we're having in Oakland. Yep. This big smile that just was welcoming and inviting. You invited me into that relationship just in terms of who you are, mm. you know, and, uh, and I've never forgotten that, and we've been good friends ever since then and gotten to know each other even better. Yes. So th it's different. How do we capture this moment now? Mm -hmm. Because, because um, you know, when I talk to my friends who are African-American, they say, Roger, I'm still, I'm still... Uh, fearful. I get pulled over. It's different for me getting pulled over. You know, I, I know, uh, I know uh, pastors in Oakland who have taught their, their sons, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of when I'm teaching to drive, the very first thing you do is you take your proof of insurance and your registration and you put it in the seat next to you because if you get pulled over, the last thing you want to do is reach into reach your in glove, glove compartment. compartment with the police officer. Right. And that was shared, you know, in a, in a group of pastors that we were in Oakland, and we got out to that particular pastor's car, and I glanced down, and guess what was in the passenger seat next to his, to the driver's seat? Mm. It was his registration and his proof of venture. Yeah. So how do we get to a point now that we leverage what people are feeling? Mm -hmm. Let's say that we can't do the world. We can't change the world. Can't right. change Berlin. Right. Although there's hope there. Can't change our nation. Can't even change the barrier. Let's just talk about the East Bay. Mm -hmm. What can we do together mm -hmm. that captures the momentum of this moment that we make real systemic change? I'm always uh, telling Pastor Kyle, my, my brother, to uh, I'm always telling him, use your white privilege for good. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, if we're somewhere and I'm talking and I'm voicing my sentiments, um, I could be looked at as the angry black guy. But when my white brother is there and he's nodding his head to what I'm saying, then what I'm saying has validity because he just co-signed it. And then I have, I have an ear. So... I'm shaking my head up and down. I'm <laughs> co-signing, but you're just saying. And, 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 and so here, here it is. It, it, it becomes uh, him using his white privilege for good. And um, um, now I'm not looked at as an angry black guy, but it's validity to what I'm saying. And so one thing we can do is speak up. Um, and, and that goes without saying anything and saying something. And uh, uh, um, uh, uh, voice your, uh, uh, the sentiment, your, your, your sentiments when it comes to uh, racial injustice, when it comes to uh, uh, racial disparities, when it comes to um, uh, hungry people, uh, poor people. Speak up. And then, number two, what we can do is show up. I, I, I talked about proximity 
and relationship and being close to the pain. Um, 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 then if you're human, if you got a, 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 a little bit of human in you, you're going to want to show up with me in solidarity. So uh, speak up, show up, and then last thing we could do is pray. Um, I don't care what nobody says. I, I, I don't care what anybody thinks. I will never give up on prayer because I know prayer works. I, I will never give up, up on prayer because I know prayer changes things. I, I will never give up on prayer because when all is said and done, I know I can talk to God. And, 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 uh, uh, and cry out for your brothers and sisters uh, uh, of, of different races. Uh, cry out before God for them, and we'll see some real change. One last question, because we, we, I want to get to your sermon. One, one last question. You know, we're, we're talking about the, the feeling of oppression. Mm-hmm. We're talking, talking about the feeling of injustice. And I had the opportunity to watch you participate with Ephraim and Corey and... Herman Hamilton. Yes. Pastor Herman Hamilton. Oh, amazing. Although I, I still say they didn't give Bernard enough time on camera. Um, and Ephraim, if you watch this, I'm, I'm telling you, you didn't give Bernard enough time on camera. But... Um, you know, one of the things that I thought was that was really driven home during that time mm-hmm. is that, you know, Jesus was, was born, you, you think the God of the universe, all-powerful, mm-hmm. but he comes in vulnerability. Yes. And he comes and he's born into a nation that is oppressed by mm-hmm. the Roman Empire. Yes. And not only oppressed by the Roman Empire, but suffered police brutality. Yes. And, you know, the crucifixion, which would have amounted to a, a public lynching, you know, in, in, in regards to that. So what, when you talk about prayer, and prayer works, because pr- God sees people who are oppressed. Mm-hmm. So what is the hope that we have, you know, when, when, we, when we go to prayer? Because we have a group that prays on Wednesday night, Mm -hmm. Pastor Isabella and her husband Charles lead this group that we pray every Wednesday night. In the last two Wednesdays, that's what we've been focused on praying for. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of praying against the racial injustice and praying for reform and change and systemic change in our nation. And so, where is the hope in terms of God entering into this and and making this a new day? Well, um... It's funny you ask that because uh, um, black people as a, uh, uh, a race of people and a culture uh, have always leaned um, and depend on God. And um, wh- whatever the circumstance, uh, uh, whatever the problem is, uh, uh, we hold on to the hope that heaven is our home. And, and, and it may be, I don't care what goes on, well, well I care, but to an extent, it, it doesn't matter what happens down here, it, it matters, but to an extent. But, but uh, whatever goes on down here, I, I, I know when I uh, 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 get to heaven, there will be no more crying, no more sorrow, no more tears, and, 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 and no more death. Now, does that mean I don't fight while I'm down here uh, uh, for systemic change? No, it, it, it doesn't. But I know once I get to heaven, uh, and, and, and I'm a, just a citizen here passing through. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a citizen of heaven. And I'm just passing through here. Heaven is my home. Uh, and, and, and I know uh, that, that man, the, the old black people used to say on that great getting up morning. <laughs> on, on that great getting up morning, I won't be plagued by none of this junk down here. And, and, and that's the hope. And, 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 and also, the hope is that when we're down here praying, that God is going to answer. Uh, 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 um, uh, God is going to answer. It, 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 it took uh, um, a, 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 couple, a few hundred years of uh, uh, Hebrew enslavement, but, but God heard their cries and, and he answered. 
Um, uh, 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 it took a while when Israel was in Babylonian captivity, but God heard their prayers and he answered. So the, the, the hope is just like God did it then, he'll do it again. And just like God did it back then, he'll do it again. And I can hold on to that hope that God hears and answers prayer. And just like he did it back then, he's going to do it again. Uh, that's a good word. That is a good word. Church family, it's important that we enter into this fight. It's important that we take a look. We need to fight for justice. This is a justice issue, um, and, and we need partners in terms of this fight. Yes. And I want you to know I'm your partner, and I want you to know that I long to see a partnership between this church and tapestry mm -hmm. in terms of what can we do together. You know, let's start it in the Bay Area. I love let's that. start it with great conversations, and let's start it with, with, uh, with incredible, meaningful times in which we, we don't settle for everything calming down and going back and waiting another seven years for something to happen. Mm -hmm. Let's grab the moment now. Yes.